I'd like to thank um, faculty members for inviting me here to speak to you today. It's an honor to come back here to the college. I haven't been here for four or five years. There's been a lot of changes and some of them are really quite awesome. So thank you very much for having me here. Here is an aerial view of the uh, College of DuPage campus. And I'd like you to note all of the standing water here on the campus. Uh, this road, just to help you out a little bit, this is uh, Faywell Boulevard. And then jumping to, if you can see that arrow over there, is about uh, where Lambert Road is. Our reconstruction restoration activities occurred primarily in two areas. The first one here, and uh, this area encompassed probably about 12 to 13 acres that we uh, restored. Now I'm going to be using for a while the terms reconstruct and res restoration quite loosely and I'll define them uh, probably about halfway through the talk. And the second area that we restored was over in here, in this area right here. And uh, here is what's called the Berg Building, okay? So 1974, this is a photograph you're looking at. Altogether, we uh, worked on about 30 acres. And most of these areas were um, basically junkyards of one sort or another when we began. In this particular area, this deciduous swamp right next to our original restoration site, there was a lot of old farm metal debris, rusty metal and so forth. Right in this area here, this was formerly a graveled parking lot and underneath it was a lot of construction debris uh, and so forth. So these are the areas that we started off with. And our goal, we had basically two goals in mind when we began. One was to convert these eyesore areas, slums so to speak, into um, ecosystems that once resembled Illinois' native landscape. And the second goal was to get students involved in meaningful conservation activities. Here we're along uh, Faywell Boulevard, and here is some of the metal that we removed from our first restoration site. During spring 1975, we had a few seeds given to us by Ray Schulenberg from the Morton Arboretum. And what we did is we planted these seeds in hills one foot apart. And each species was labeled. And I always say that if you don't want it to rain, plant prairie. And you can see here comes my rainmakers. And, um, and I remember this very well because it was our first planting. And it was right during the exam week when students needed extra credit. So I had pretty much all the help I needed. Um, anyway, it was really pretty exciting in 1975. Many people here at the uh, college were quite interested in the prairie and curious about it. Even one of the vice presidents remarked to me once how great the prairie looked. Well, I didn't take this as a compliment because he was talking about this area over here. <laughs> Here's the region where we planted a prairie. And over here, there was just nothing growing about we except weeds was growing. <laughs> so I did not uh, take offense to this comment because this was a time when people did not know much about prairie, let alone how to spell it. <laughs> and I, do, I did notice one of the things when I came back into campus, I said I haven't been here for four or five years, I do see some of the neat street names that are here like tall grass. Prairie Drive, whatever the exact name was, I'm not certain. So that was kind of neat. Here's the way this planting looked in the first fall. And you can see the hills one foot apart. Some of the advantages, we could get a lot of area planted with a few seeds. Uh, made it easy for seedling identification. Later on for eventual seed collection. And also this served as a precursor to our prairie beds that we planted around the campus. Uh, some of the disadvantage is the included if uh, we had poor germination, we had to go back and replant them. And also sometimes we had a, a mammal, I'll talk about a little later, uh, uh, vole damage. They found it very easy to make meals out of the rootstocks out of these compass plants here. During the fall 1975, 
We um, collected uh, seeds from nearby prairie remnants. And I want to say this, that during the entire time of our plantings here at the College of DuPage campus, all of the species came from within an area, from within a distance of 15 miles of the campus. That was our parameters. Of course, there are some exceptions. We had two exceptions. One is that we got shooting star seeds from down by Star Rock. And the second exception was the Canada milk vetch, which uh, the seeds were given to me. Um, they came from the west end of DeKalb County. So we didn't have a whole lot of seeds and we wanted to plant a fairly large area, so we planted them in rows 18 inches apart. All right, in, in this bucket here, there's about 20 different species, okay? Now, I want to tell you that on real sunny days, the college boys would drive by very, very slowly. <laughs> and so I nicknamed this group Prairie Watch. Uh, by the way, this young lady here now has her own landscape business. Well, besides maximizing the seeds to cover a fairly large area by planting in rows, it made it relatively easy to remove weeds even though you can see that um, we occasionally got behind on our weeding. And the directions were quite simple, that if the plants were growing in rows, you'd leave them unless otherwise instructed. And if they were not growing in rows, you just simply, we'd remove them by various different means, okay? Uh, depending upon if they were an annual or pre-annual, and I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that unless you wanna ask questions about it after. Here is what the 1976 prairie plantings that we planted in rows 18 inches apart looked like in 1991. Isn't that pretty? We had to wait 15 years, but uh, they came around, looked very, very nice. Then eventually what we did, this was only about an acre and a half where we first started our plantings. We eventually moved from over here's um, Faywell Boulevard, and we eventually moved up here what used to be the old farmhouse. and we had an area of about six or seven acres looking like this. Very, very pretty. Now, I didn't go back. I should have defined a weed. Um, a weed, that's a plant that thrives in disturbed and degraded conditions. It's not part of a stable ecosystem. Eventually, we began reestablishing prairie using seedlings. Now, prior to obtaining greenhouse space, my wife and I decided rather than to complain about it, we grew these seedlings in cold flats along our driveway. Um, each year, we'd done this for about four years, and each spring, beginning April 1, we'd plant the seeds. And then my wife Pam would, um, on cold evenings, rainy days, she would take this clear plastic and cover up the cold frames where the seedlings were, and then on sunny days, uncover them. So you do not need a greenhouse to grow seedlings, but it sure is nice. And uh, this is one activity that the students always really enjoyed was, uh, you know, working in a greenhouse, planting the seeds, and transplanting the seedlings and so forth. It's really kind of a nice activity to do, relaxing. So for about four years, we would bring to the college from our house about, um, you know, maybe like four to 5,000 seedlings. Now, one of the reasons why the college's prairies is so rich in diversity in species is because of these seedlings. So what I did basically from 1978 until the year 2000, for another 25 years until 2003, I would transport these seedlings either from a home or from a greenhouse, which was on the other side of the campus, out to the prairie in my pickup trucks. The use of my trucks did not cost the college a dime. Many of these seedlings were planted on a hill prairie that was recently leveled. Here is how I remember the hill prairie. Students planting seedlings. Now, I'm going to divert now from uh, prairie plantings to prairie destruction. Throughout my years at the college, we always had some uh, destruction activities occurring 
which at the time uh, may have seemed to be critical, but overall were quite insignificant. For example, many prairies had problems with deer eating the plant and doing some destruction. We did not have deer on the campus, just occasional one here and there, so we didn't have any damage uh, due to deer, but we did have a small mammal, the metal vole, that we nicknamed the deer vole. Okay, you can see it there. We had quite a few of them. And the reason why we had quite a few of these uh, voles is basically because of lack of predators such as hawks and fox. Our campus just isn't really big enough to have a real sustainable population of them. So what happened is uh, in the fall of the year, well, we can't quite see that one, that's all right. Up there some places ahead of a purple cone flower, okay? But basically what they did during the fall of the year when they were hungry, and a lot of them, their populations were quite high, is that they would eat the rootstocks of many of our prairie forbs, such as pur pale purple coneflower and wild quinine. Now, had we had natural predators on campus instead of myself, <laughs> we would have uh, had maybe four or 5,000 easily of the pale purple coneflower and wild quinine. Okay, those were a couple of their favorites, amongst others. One night in um, early summer, maybe in June, I suspect, late June, a fly-by-night landscape company came by and they dug out over 100, and you can guess it, pale purple coneflowers, Echinacea pallida. Well, I can recall going to the security department and complaining about it, and they just kind of poo-pooed my complaint. So my next stop, was about 15 minutes later, was to Dr. McEnage's office. And then, for many, many years, the security department had a permanent camera on this area next to Lambert Road, so it would not happen again. And I would like to say that um, throughout my years at the um, college here, I worked primarily under Dr. McEnage, and Dr. Murphy, and both of these presidents were very ardent supporters of our prairie reconstructions and also the students that, uh, supporters of the students that helped out on these. Other destruction activities included, um, occasionally there was uh, accidental lawn herbiciding that drifted into the prairie and occasional dumpings. Now, construction activities here on campus these projects, this is the um, ultimate damage to the prairies. As new projects are envisioned on campus, protection of the prairie must, also, must always take precedent. Over and over again, not only on this campus, but I, ob I observed as to how architects and engineers feel that they can make the landscape better with um, a building, and then a paved parking lot. And the administration is always going to have an explanation why this particular building is required, why it's needed. And unfortunately, the prairie is often seen as expendable, especially by those who don't know, do not know much about its value. Uh, and also perhaps lack conservation ethics. So I would like to, um, pictured here again is a hill prairie that was destroyed. And I'd like to recommend to the faculty, especially the biology faculty, that they be very persistent with prairie education and conservation efforts. There are ways of doing this without being fired. And as I mentioned, I had pretty good rapport with the presidents of the school. And I can recall one day going to Dr. Murphy's office four times during the day for some item that was on my mind. And this is some of the times things, things that you just have to do. Sometimes my personal feelings is that if this does not occur, um, that the prairies will be whittled away little by little, which would be a shame because they're too difficult to Reestablish. 
Now, I mentioned that I had pretty good rapport with the administration and the Board of Trustees, but this did not always come easy. About every two years, I would give um, the top administrators a tour of the prairie and also the Board of Trustees, either a tour of the prairie or a presentation. And I can recall that many times they didn't say, oh, Russ, give us a tour, give us a talk. I had to go in there and tell them that I wanted to do it. And if they'd say no, I'd be back until they said yes. And sometimes this is just what you have to do. Um, many times there were a couple items a couple th areas that I failed in, I think, um, maybe through no fault of my own, but I was unsuccessful in getting our uh, top administrators, especially the presidents, even though I got along with them real well, to get them to promote high-rise parking lots here on campus. And my feeling was always that this would save valuable land and for athletic fields, for example, and also for more prairies. And the other area in which I was unsuccessful is to get them to permanently protect the prairies. And the argument that I got from them constantly was by them I talking about the administration. Well, the, board of, the current board of trustees would not ever approve anything like this because it would tie the hands of the future boards. And I would come back and say to them, well, what about this building that you're proposing? You know, this structure certainly is going to tie the hands of future boards, will it not? You know, it was an idealistic argument, but I never won that one. And, um, and I do feel that, um, you know, the College of DuPage with its facilities could easily become the prairie center of the Chicago region with its current facilities. Very, very nice. I toured some of the places today. All right, we will now follow some prairie activities along Lambert Road. This is basically a second area in which we did our prairie plantings. This photo was taken in 1974, and you can see the Berg Building. One area that you, you see a lot of standing water, obviously, but one area you don't see over here is where there was a graveled parking lot. All right, and um, during spring 1984, clay and rubble that came from the Mackinac Center that was stockpiled in this marsh area was spread out rather evenly over this formerly graveled parking lot. And then it was uh, top dressed with about seven to 10 centimeters of black soil. And we had Dr. Mackinac's blessings and also the Board of Trustees uh, blessings to do this also. So in spring 1984, we planted a lot of seedlings along what was uh, the SRC drive. It's no longer there, okay? But we planted a lot of seedlings, and here is where the students were on their knees planting just a few minutes ago, uh, in the previous slide, many years ago. All right, and here is going up to the Berg building and what's the SRC building. I don't know if that's the same name of it or not. It might be. All right, here the students are planting and they're facing Lambert Road, 1984 photo. Here's the way it looked like in 1987, okay? This gave a very, very nice appearance for people, uh, you know, driving up to the campus in, in, in the high traffic area. We then also in 1984, another common method that we used in our reconstructions was by seed broadcast. Now in each bucket now we have, in this bucket we have about 30 different species of prairie plants. So after they were spread on the ground, hand broadcast, we strawed the area and then we compacted the seeds into the soil with a roller, cull packer, tractor tires, whatever we could get our hands on basically. Now I'd like you to note our high tech irrigation watering system that we now have. And how it was very, very easy to get highly qualified help. <laughs> Here is the area where the children were standing in a previous slide and you've seen me broadcasting. 
This is the way it looked in 1987, four years later. So it takes about four years from the time we begin to the time we really start seeing some good results. Good results, excuse me. Next we see here is a combination of the two planting methods that we primarily used. These are from seedling transplant. This is the beautiful prairie milkweed. And here I'm standing right on Lambert Road and this area was primarily broadcast with seeds. So the two together give really, really nice prairies, very nice, rich in diversity. This was a newly planted Kentucky bluegrass lawn that was mowed for a year or two. So we decided to, to make this into um, an oak savanna. In 1991, we planted 10 burr oak trees and 10 white oak trees, 100 feet apart. In 1992, we planted 20 oak trees, 100 foot apart again. Then from 1993 to 1995, I plowed and dissed in between the oak trees. And then the students and myself, we planted a lot of seedlings and we did a lot of seed broadcasting. Here's what the site looked like in 1998. Okay, this is the way it looks seven years later for this site. And the savanna is a very rare ecosystem, a very precious one. We define a savanna as being, this is an area in which the tree canopy does not totally shade the ground. I certainly was not the first person in the Chicago region to uh, think of prairie restoration and also to be aware of how endangered this ecosystem had become. Shown here is Dr. Robert Betts, Ray Schulenberg, Dr. Herb Lamp, and that um, pictured here should be Floyd Swink. These are our really early pioneers in the Chicago region. Pictured here with myself and Ray Schulenberg are two of my student workers from 1976. Isn't that something? Over here, this is Dr. Larry Stritch. Dr. Stritch is what's equivalent to the head botanist for the U.S. Forest Service Department, U.S. Forest Service in Washington, D.C. To the right is Eric Ulysses. Eric is in charge of species procurement at the Medewin Tallgrass Prairie. This is part of the former Joliet Arsenal, an 8,000 acre restoration site. And that's Eric's job, determining what species, where to get the seeds from, so on, so on. Well, the beginning of prairie for me was this man, Ray Schulenberg. I was first introduced to the prairie by him in 1971. And for years, I sought advice from Ray. And also, he gave me uh, permission to freely collect seeds from the Morton Arboretum Prairie that he established and it was later named after him. So I hope that all of you in this room, a lot of nice young people here, that you are as fortunate as I am in obtaining a mentor such as Ray, somebody that you can ask questions to, you know, and never feel too stupid about it. Next we want to ask ourselves is why do we plant prairie? And thus far I've been using the terms reconstruction and restoration quite freely, maybe even confusing to you, okay, but um, restoration was a term that was used for prairie plantings when we first began doing it in 1974. Uh, the term went back to the 1930s when the first restoration sites were done at the University of Wisconsin up in Madison. Uh, and restoration technically it implies that some native plants are present. Reconstruction basically implies that there are no native plants present, that you're study, starting on bare ground. And basically this is what we did. Most of our work has been reconstruction. Now there are a lot of other terms that I've heard at various different talks and in the writings. One is prairie plantings, which are pretty safe saying that word revitalization, reestablishment. I don't get too hung up on every, whatever term people use. Just use them and do it and uh, people will know what you're talking about. Okay. 
Well, one of the um, reasons for planting prairie here on campus was to restore, is for like an outdoor laboratory. In the early 1970s, many of the other biology instructors and myself, we would regularly take students to the Morton Arboretum for our studies. Well, it didn't take long to figure out that this took money and gas to go to and from, even though it's a short distance. We wasted a lot of instruction time and learning time. And this is not even to speak about the fact of the potential liability if there was a serious accident that would have occurred to and front, to and from the Arboretum. So the answer was pretty obvious, is to reconstruct our own natural areas. And this is like, uh, kind of like a precursor to uh, homeschooling, if you will. The other, another major reason for restoring prairie is to get students involved in meaningful conservation activities. Here are some students after we collected some seeds from the West Chicago Prairie. Here are students removing weeds from our prairie seed beds. This is after they learned the names of the weeds and something about their ecology. For years, the college community would see students working out in the prairies as these people drove to and from the college and kind of kept their curiosity up, I hope. And I want to say this, that it was really a lot of fun working with students. I always enjoyed that and joking around and uh, sometimes just doing miserable jobs, but it was just a lot of fun. The prairie is America's most endangered ecosystem. 99.99% of the prairie has been destroyed. For example, Illinois, the prairie state, there are 2,000 43 acres of virgin prairie remaining. This is out of the 20,428,000 acres of prairie that Illinois once had. There are, a hectare is equal to 2.47 acres. So one of the goals that we had before we planted our first seed was to duplicate natural areas of Illinois, to duplicate these prairies. And to do this, we visited uh, prairie remnants, and we would note the plant associations that occurred in these virgin remnants. For example, here we can see lead plant in bloom, and this is prairie coreopsis in this hill prairie. Here's a hill prairie that we planted right along Lambert Road here. Here is lead plant, here is prairie coreopsis, in addition to other species. At the Wolf Road Prairie in Westchester, Illinois, this was an area where it was quite uh, wet, um, uh, a hydric prairie, so to speak, a lot of standing water. This is right by our marsh here at the College of DuPage. This is one of our efforts to restore wetland prairies. Now, because of our knowledge of biotechnology, we now know that we cannot afford to lose any genes Shown here is a leafy prairie clover, a federal endangered species that we had considerable success growing. And other reasons for planting prairie, especially on this campus, is because of the deep, extensive root systems that the prairie plants, especially the grasses, have. Each one of these clumps of prairie grasses, drop seed, big blue stem, and switchgrass, they have over one mile of root system, a very, very fibrous root system. It's kind of like an upside down rainforest. You see most of the living biomass is beneath the soil, not above it like in a rainforest. Compare this root system, if you will, to the Kentucky bluegrass. Here the root systems only go down about six inches. So obviously these are gonna have a much greater water absorption capacity, capability. Shown here is a slide from July 18th, 1996. During a 24-hour period here on a College of DuPage campus, we had over 16 inches of rain in one 24-hour period. During the day, it would rain and just pour down in buckets, so to speak. And then it would be intermediate for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then down it would come again. 
Well, during one of these rain intermissions, the college photographer, Gene Sladek, and I went out to our first prairie planting. This is along Faywell Boulevard, very, where I showed the old metal debris, the second slide. And we took this photograph of standing water. You can see it's three inches. Then we walked, we're only about 10 foot from the prairie. Then we walked into the prairie about five foot and note, no standing water. Just about 15 feet apart. Isn't that amazing? It's just, so it's just got a tremendous water absorption capabilities, these prairie plants do, especially the grasses, and which of course helps to reduce a lot of runoff. Another reason for planting prairie is because of its beauty and aesthetics. Each week during the growing season, there's an average of 15 species in bloom. Now I will say this, when, you go, when you're driving by, let's say 60 miles an hour by a prairie, you don't really notice it. The prairie's kind of subtle. You have to walk by it and look down to really see a lot of this beauty, but it's there. Next, I'd like to uh, make a few comments about burning. Burning is essential <clears throat> to maintaining the prairie ecosystem. And especially on a campus such as the College of DuPage, which there is a lot of water and hence cool soils. Cool soils favor the growth of weeds, uh, non-native ones, and also cool season weeds such as reed canary grass and Canada thistle. Some of the reasons for burning includes that it helps to uh, re uh, reduce woody shrub invasion. Following a burn, the nutrients are going to be returned to the soil much faster. And I mentioned about weeds. This is very important. Over here, you can see we burnt this area here. I don't know if you see this or not, but the grasses are kind of light and colored. We burnt that area. Here in the foreground, where it's kind of like a drab colored grasses, we did not burn here. And already before the summer was over, about midsummer, we started to see like weeds like Canada thistle starting to, to emerge. And it doesn't take very long for some of these cool season weeds to really become established and take a pretty good foothold unless you just keep battling them and battling and battling them. And certainly fire helps to reduce their uh, possibilities of even getting started. In addition, uh, burning also promotes flowers, uh, flowering for many species. This happens to be a photograph of compass plant. Now, um, speaking, um, you know, away from the text a little bit here, but I know that um, burning in a suburban campus is much more difficult than the burning I now do out in the Iowa farmlands. Out there, we don't need no permits, nothing. We just go and burn. Sometimes 20, 30. One day I burnt 120 acres for people by myself. Just burn it, let it go. And um, we, don't, we can't do that in a suburban campus here because people uh, complain even here in, on a college community about smoke getting into the air ducts. But however, you know, usually the wind burnt, uh, blows from different directions every day and there's usually some area or one area or another that can be burnt almost any given day when it's time to do so, spring or fall, that is for burning. And you don't cause too much disruptions. Also on this campus, it's unlikely that the fires would get away because of the Kentucky bluegrass lawns that surrounds most of them. My successor, Brian McWade, for a few years, both him and I, we often burned on the weekends, during vacations, so that we wouldn't cause too much disruptions. And I was very delighted to hear and to see that this spring the prairies were recently burned. When you go out there this summer, you're really gonna be in for a pleasant surprise. Very, very nice. Burning something that just has to be done. And if you're a pyromaniac, you really feel good about it, okay? Let's <laughs> say that too. It's, people get amazed by it. Here's a photograph of the prairie in the wintertime which I think is really quite aesthetic, at least in my eyes. And before too long, this is a photograph from the Hill Prairie along Lambert Road. I can almost bet if you go out there in the end of June, you'll see a photograph. You'll see 
a situation that looks pretty much like this. So I'd like to thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. So thanks so much for letting me come back and speak with you.